talking about being cucked, you know, you build the house, you sell it to a landlord, and then you pay the landlord three times what you are renting out for directly to them. Like it's, that, that's not a good deal. No, we're talking in Trumpian yeah. terms. That's a bad, bad Maggie, deal. Maggie cucked yeah. the UK housing market. <laughs> Now, it might seem a little strange to be interviewing my colleague here on Downstream, but Michael Walker is becoming something of an expert on the housing crisis. He is, after all, the host of the podcast series Crash Course. Did I say you can support on Patreon? Well, you can. Michael Walker, welcome to Downstream. Something feels odd about this conversation. You're interviewing me. Yeah. I often don't get this uh, opportunity. It feels quite strange. I've interviewed some big, big names. I don't like to. I do like to blow my own trumpet, but <laughs> this is not me blowing my own trumpet. I've interviewed some big names, some interesting people. I think Michael Walker's right up there. Too kind. Easier to get though. You know, you didn't have to send Very me too many to emails before I agreed to this interview. Just open the door. I said, Michael, that's it. You're, you're <laughs> get next. Get in there. Yeah. I mean, the thing is though, particularly since 2020, since COVID, your star has really risen with Navarra Media, obviously you were doing Tiski three nights a week and whatnot. And I think lots of people who don't necessarily know about or like Navarra, don't like me, don't like Ash, or just don't know about us, I think they found you on YouTube and they went, wow, this is somebody who's impartial, balanced. They're open about their political commitments, which you do have. You don't say you don't have political commitments. And your emphasis is, is on relaying information, making the audience informed, which actually is so rare now in the media landscape. Yeah, no, thank you. I think that's very kind. And I mean, I do, I do feel like I've found my space because i'm not the best polemicist not the best writer you know I, I can't do what you or owen or ash do on the television as well as you do but i can do sort of curiosity i think i, I approach politics with curiosity i'm not particularly ideological i think so i like asking questions i think that's really i think it's really valuable i think it's really valuable and i i've said all of that not just to blow smoke up your backside but because what we're talking about today is your new podcast series crash course mm -hmm. which really adopts this this process, this approach to our asking the sort of bigger questions of the 21st century? Yeah, so the, the thinking for this, for me, was I absolutely love my job. I love doing Navarra Live, but the whole nature of it is we do stories for 15 minutes and we move on. Um, you know, so I, I'm, I'm sort of cumulatively building up a lot of knowledge, but you're never going into one topic really deeply. And I feel at the end of it, I really understand what's going on. Um, whereas, I mean, I'm only on the first series now, but I do actually feel like I do understand quite a lot about renting and housing that I didn't before. And I'm hoping to take the audience on that journey as well. So before we go any further, this is the trailer for the first series of Crash Course, your new podcast series. Did I mention it's on Patreon where you can support Michael? Oh, there is some free content. Okay. So, you know, try that out first. Uh, and this is on the housing crisis. See what you think. Are you paying extortionate rents to pay off someone else's mortgage? Have you been hit with a massive rent increase to line your landlord's pockets in the middle of a cost of living crisis? Or are you finding yourself living in ever smaller spaces so you can afford to stay in a city you love, only to find damp above your bed? Well, you're not alone. Rents are up 20% in London this year. People are paying four-figure sums just to view properties and rising interest rates could make even more of you homeless. So inspired by the irritation, I feel at paying 40% of my income to a stranger for doing not very much, I'm launching a podcast series to explain why renting sucks in Britain and what we can do to change it. Along the way, I'll speak to tenants on the front line of Britain's housing crisis, to campaigners fighting for a better housing system for us all, and yes, to some landlords. If that sounds like your thing, search on your favourite podcast app for Crash Course with Michael Walker, or even better, go to Patreon and look up Crash Course Pod. So you say that 40% of your income goes on rent every month. How much is that? I've been very open about this. I, I say on the podcast, £800. So I pay £800 a month, and that's for a free bedroom ex-council flat in Hackney, um, where I live with to other people of a similar age to myself. 40% um, of my income, I get about two grand after tax. So yeah, that, 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 that's the and math. That's insurance how it works out. and pensions yeah. and student loans. Yeah, student loans, that's a bummer, isn't it? But although, to be honest, I say the student loans is a bummer, but one of the reasons I did this series on rent and why I talk about it so much on Navarra as well is because, especially when the cost of living crisis, I mean, obviously, for many people, the last 13 years have been a cost of living crisis, right? But the cost of living crisis that got especially acute last year and this year, Everyone's talking about energy, you know, quite rightly for, for lots of people paying energy is, is, is an impossible task. But for me, I'm like, oh, my energy has gone up from 50 pound to 80 pound a month. 
my rent this whole time has been 800 pounds, mm. right? So, so when all of these scary figures are being sort of expressed about how, what energy will cost, I'm sort of like, well, you know, the biggest chunk out of my income is, is my rent. And we don't talk about that so often. And there's 11 million people in this country in the private rental sector, I think. Yeah, exactly. And it's almost like they're completely detached from the rest of the political conversation. Because like you say, price of energy has doubled, let's say. That's extraordinary. It's a political crisis. Everybody talks about it. Well, hold on. I lived in London for 15 years. And I think probably the average rent increase year on year was 10% or more for, for, for 15 years. Often it was far more than that. Actually, I'm probably being very conservative with that. So it does feel like you have these 11 million people in the private rental sector and they're just absent in the political conversation. Why is that? Well, I mean, I suppose it used to be the case, and I think potentially sort of like political culture hasn't quite woken up to the difference that sort of being a private renter was uh, something you did for a little while in your 20s before you bought a house. So there'd be people who were qualified for social housing, you'd live in social housing, there are people who are essentially future homeowners. So, And that's what the private sector was, future homeowners. Um, but with the decline of social housing, obviously you're getting lots more people at the bottom of the income um, ladder ending up relying on private landlords and then you've got a whole generation of people like myself who even though I've got a professional job I'm in my 30s there's no way in hell I can afford a house so you've got loads of people who are renting who you know I think politics doesn't quite have the understand sort of the type there isn't who, who are these people and what are their concerns I think that there's a cultural element there I think probably more important though is a hard-headed electoral one which is renters are concentrated in inner cities um, and that's where elections more recently have been fairly uncompetitive because everyone votes Labour anyway. So the Tories aren't going to be particularly inclined to listen to the concerns of, of, of renters and neither are Labour really because they're all now appealing to the so-called Red Wall or, I mean, to, to talk about it not in cultural terms, we can just say older homeowners, right? Who are the real swing voters um, in our country at the moment? I think one third issue again is economics. And what I mean by saying that is that when you've got mortgage holders, their mortgage costs are actually quite impactful to investment cycles and to economic growth. So if homeowners are struggling, that's bad for the wider economy, yeah. given the economic model we've got. If renters are struggling, <laughs> yeah, that's going to lower consumption a little bit, but there's not going to be any financial crisis because renters are struggling to pay their rent. As a separate point to that, though, I'd also say that there's the, the practical issues around... Um, renting and just being able to vote. Renters are obviously less likely to be on the electoral register than owner occupiers. They'll be moving every year, two years. It's far more difficult to canvas them, to have data on them. When you're getting out the vote, it's often people who've been in homes and you've had data on them for several years at least. And renters, students, um, people in their late 20s who are moving every one, two years, they don't figure in any of that. And, and I think that's also a factor in the kind of invisibilization of these people as an electoral constituency, despite being 11 million people. And I know you're saying they're concentrated in cities, but 11 million people, is, that's more voters than Labour won in, in, um, in 2019. And before people go, well, that's just because Jeremy Corbyn was useless. That's more people than Labour won in 2005 under Tony Blair. It's an enormous number of people. And it seems strange to me that both political parties are kind of sitting on this and sleeping on this as a potential electoral grievance. There seems to be so much possibility in this, just some slight tweaks um, that could yield real political dividends for either of the major parties. I think it's not going to be the Conservatives for a bunch of reasons we can talk about. Why do you think that's not the case? Why do you think Labour in particular are sleeping on this? Well, I suppose because, I mean, the sad truth is that renters and homeowners, are our interests are quite in conflict. I mean, I suppose that used to be papered over because many renters expected themselves to become homeowners. homeowners sorry. And so while they're you know, being screwed right now, they're looking forward to the golden goose um, of owning a home in the future. Now, actually, I think you, you have got a strong divide between renters and homeowners. There are still, e even if there are 11 million renters, there are many, many more homeowners. And many of the policies which are going to be good for renters, building more housing, building more housing of sort of different forms and different types, social housing, potentially introducing rent controls, these kind of things do have the potential. I mean, none of these things are going to crash the housing market, right? None of these things are going to make people poor and collapse the economy. But what they could do is mean that the capital gains that homeowners are making across the country are slightly lower than they otherwise would be. And voters care about the capital gains they get from their, uh, their houses. So if you've got the majority of the population who are homeowners, and I think there is always going to be 
a difficulty for renters to have their voice heard. It's also interesting to say, I mean, you know, we've talked about where where renters live, how renting or the interest of renters in, interacts with the interest of the wider economy or the, the health of the wider economy. There's also just like, I think the most simple way of explaining this is where are the two places where people always talk about where it's okay to rent? Germany and Vienna. How many people rent in Germany? 55%. How many people rent in Vienna? 80%. If a majority of people rent, renting is going to be okay. And this is one of the reasons why I am so, I suppose, pissed off about like Labour's I don't want to talk too much about Kista Armour and Labour in this interview, but their promise to say we're going to make 70% homeowners, I thought was particularly sort of like, just ridiculous. Because uh, what if what you want to have is renting being a reasonable thing to do, you need a lot of renters, right? That's like what it's like in Germany, because then you have powerful people who are also renting. Because it's not just that we're uh, a numerical majority, it's also, as you say, marginally, electorally and economically marginalised people. Now, if you have the majority of people renting as they do in Vienna, as they do in Germany, then you have powerful people renting and then, lo and behold, the interests of renters are listened to. Sticking with Labour, and I agree, we're not going to rant about Keir Starmer and Labour because, on the one hand, likely next government, and they are also realistically the only party that's actually going to deliver changes on this stuff. On the other, we want to talk about the issues and not just, you know, kick politicians. But that 70% quite unquote ambition. I mean, that, that was that was the worst of sort of politics is just press release, right? It's like, oh, okay. They, you know, there's no like policy wonker has gone into that. No thought, no engaging with think tanks or stakeholders or shelter say this, you know, private landlord interest groups say this, none, none of that, right? Which by the way, those people should, probably shouldn't be listened to, but not even, right? It was just, all right. It used to be 76%, I think, home ownership in this country. It peaked in 2003 mid to low 70s, now it's mid to low 60s. Let's just punt it back up to 70% again. Okay, why? Why should it be 70%? Why should it be 70%? And we can talk about actually the adverse effects this will have for renters in a number of other ways throughout the show. But it just showed to me, wow, wow, 15 years after the global financial crisis on an issue as big as housing, you're still doing politics by press release. Mind blowing. Um, just a few numbers we talked about this before the show because you've talked to so many people and they've said so many facts and figures. I was a bit worried you might have forgotten some of them. You haven't. Michael Walker's brain is like a supercomputer. <laughs> the numbers are really jaw-dropping, okay? So I said 11 million renters. 2.5 million people struggle to pay their rent every month at the moment. That's an increase of 45% since last year. 2.5 million people a month. One third of renters, that's one third of those 11 million people, of course, some of those will be children and whatnot, but they're in, in households affected by this statistic. One third of renters spend 50% of their income or more on rent. One third spend 50% or more. So actually, Michael, you're, you're doing well. Only yeah. 40%. Well, I mean, I, I, I would never claim that I am the person worst affected by the rental crisis. And I mean, throughout the podcast series, I've been speaking to, to lots of people who are affected by this crisis much more harshly than, than I am. But that is a phenomenal statistic. And you think about why, why has the economy been stagnant for decades, right? Well, especially since 2008. Why have we not had growth? Why have we got low consumer demand? Why do our high streets look empty? Well, if you've got people paying 50% of their income... Mm -hmm to a landlord, and right, someone else is getting that money, yes, but the, the nature of um, consumption is that if you're rich, you spend less of your money, you save more of it. If you're poor, you spend most of it. So well, if you've got poor they people- They buy more buy to let houses, right? They buy more assets. They'll buy more assets, exactly. So you've got people who would be spending money out in their communities, pumping half of their income to a landlord who's then not really gonna spend it, or if they do, they're gonna spend it on assets, not really you know, things which help jobs in the economy, for example. And it, it, it just seems phenomenal that that's acceptable. And you also have, I mean, so if you took, you know, the right wing argument, so if you tax people too much, there'll be no incentive to earn money and they're not going to be able to spend, not going to be able to use their wisdom as a consumer to, to buy the right products. And that's how the free market works. If you've got everyone who's just paying 50% of their income to a landlord through no choice of their own, you know, the landlord doesn't improve their service the more they pay you. That's why I get so annoyed when I get a, like a rent hike, because it's like the house is the same. <laughs> the house is the same. Why is it 15% more expensive this year compared to last year? The house is the same. Have you said that to landlords before? I, I mean, I have said that to landlords on my podcast. I've said that to landlords that aren't my landlord. The issue is, and this is the sad fact, is to your own landlord, you have to be pretty meek, right? You're not going to have much 
chance of persuading your landlord or having a fight with your landlord and winning because the law is all stacked in their favor. And I had a, you know, last summer, this was one of the inspirations for doing the podcast series, actually. So we got uh, an email from our landlord, you know, in those really, uh, those sort of like faux polite terms, they always said, like, it's almost good news that they're only going to give you a 15% pay rise instead of a, not pay rise, sorry, heaven forbid, uh, a 15% rent rise instead of a 30% rent rise. Like, good news. Uh, it's only going to be 15% this year. But sh- she emailed us, you know, the, the letting agent, we don't speak directly to the landlord, and sort of said, look, you've been getting a reduced rent because of COVID. If we were to put your flat on the open market, um, we could get 2800 for it. But we're willing to give you a deal. We're going to give you it for 2400 This is a ex-council flat, free free bedrooms in, in, in Hackney. And so when I first read that, I'm like, like you know, ex-council flat in Hackney, free bedrooms, they're not going to get 2800 for that. This is a marketing technique. Um, I'm going to email her back and say, like, I call bullshit, et cetera, et cetera. Then I go on Zoopla and right move. And I'm like, you know, she's she's right. You know, it's not just, but she is, she is right. And then by doing uh, the podcast and speaking to people who did have to look for houses last summer, I'm really glad that we did just, we just folded, right? It, it felt a bit humiliating to just say, fine, yeah, we'll pay 2,400 pounds. There's no point in pissing off your landlord, right? Because you want to live there for as long as possible. We'll pay 2,400 pounds. Um, and, but I am glad I did because, I mean, I think as we'll, as we'll talk about, people who had to look for a new flat this summer ended up paying a lot more than that and had to look for three months, right? So you have to be meek to landlords. It's depressing. It shouldn't be the case. You don't have to be meek to landlords in every country in the world, but in this country, especially in cities where you've got housing shortages, that's, the name of the game. Yeah. Are you worried that a landlord will see who you are? Like, my God, that's my tenant slagging off landlords. They've done a whole podcast saying that I'm making too much. And Well, I think if I was renting this, if, if I had been looking for a new place, as I say, I think my letting agent is fairly in anonymous. I don't know who my landlord is. Um, I, I don't imagine my letting agents are sort of like going through Twitter looking at the tenants because it's not, you know, they don't have a reason to be obsessed with that. But talking to people who have tried to find a new flat this or last summer now, it because your competition is so high, there are people who have like two hour Zoom conversations with a landlord, right? And this is, and, and he's asking them about their job. He's asked, I had just speaking to one person who was saying, he was asking us why we as sort of three young men in our 30s all wanted to live together as if sort of like asking them if they were gay or not. Wow. And then sort of like asking people that. Was, int- that, was that, were they gay? Uh, you know what? I don't think so. Right, okay. <laughs> I've no, no, never if, actually had that conversation with the person n- in question, but I don't think so. No, but if, I mean, if they were and he's sort of got that sense and then he's, and that's then led him to ask those kinds of questions. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's deeply troubling. Well, I mean, I think I, I, there are, I mean, especially this is, I, I, you know, I think there's less prejudice against gay people than there is against people of colour at the moment, and especially from the perspective of a landlord. So I think there are lots of people where if you're non-white and you're looking for a flat and you're competing with, uh, you know, three thirty-somethings who are white and look professional or three thirty-somethings who are black and aren't perceived to look professional according to the landlord, right? They They don't have to justify why they chose the white ones instead of the black ones right they don't have to do an audit um they just say oh i'm i feel very confident with those guys and and that will be that and i have spoken to people people of color especially who say sort of like they feel like they've been put under more scrutiny situations where you've had sort of four people going for a flat one of them non-white who gets sort of asked for sort of extra information no because none of this is regulated right it's not like when you apply for a job and you know prejudice exists when you apply for a job yeah but at least when you apply for a job there is a process whereby if you suspect that prejudice was part of that decision you know there is some recourse and you know big companies have to do audits when it comes to private renting none of that exists do you think maybe he thought oh it's three gay guys they might do the place up potentially some, you no know, some you know it's had a bit of glamour Although some I live style. With, uh, my my house is three gay guys and it? it's not in the best state we don't upkeep it it's not it's not it's not not, not kept to the highest standards although i really hope my landlord yeah, is watching say, now. jesus christ you're 30 I'm 33. You're 33? Yeah. You just, what's your secret? You always look so young. <laughs> it's not getting up early in the morning. I well, think. I don't Because do I've got an I'm evening show. Young. Don't don't wake up too early. Ages. 33? Yeah. I don't know why I thought you were 30. I thought you were 31. You just have that youthful sort of zest to you. As a 33-year-old man, um, in a major city, there's certain things that you value, like, you know, connection, um, amenities and so on and so forth. You're not looking at, you know, school catchment areas or I don't know, a drive for your car. 
what would be the ideal housing situation for you? You know, I was thinking about this and I actually really like my housing situation. Like I think it's, it's I, I live with two people I like. It's quite social. I live quite a social lifestyle. I don't have dependents. You know, I, I am probably in a rather unique position. Well, not unique because there's many people like me, but a specific, let's say a specific condition whereby the fact that I have to share a house in my 30s, I don't mind. I'm fine with that. Um, obviously, it would be nice to have the option to, to live on my own. Um, or, but I, and I don't have that option, it's very important to say. But for me, I don't actually mind the current situation. I don't mind renting. So this is also another sort of thing that's motivated me in thinking about this and talking to people about this, is I don't really want to own a home, right? I, I quite like, I mean, if I had the money, I would, because obviously it makes sense to own a home because the whole system is stacked in favor of homeowners. But in an ideal world, I like renting. I like the fact that I can move if my lifestyle changes. I can move if my relationship status changes. I like living with different people year by year. I think it sort of gives a certain you know, variety to life. So when I think, what do I want? I want to live somewhere like Vienna, where you can rent and it's affordable and high quality. And also your city isn't full of homeless people because you've got a housing crisis, mm. right? I, I don't, I'm not annoyed because I can't get on the property ladder. I'm annoyed because I can't live a life as a renter with affordable rents and with some certainty. I think the thing that annoys me most about my particular housing situation, as I say, I'm relatively lucky. I don't hate where I live. I like who I live with, is that I know that my 12 month contract ends in July and I've got no idea how much they're going to raise my rent by. Right. So it, it could easily be the case that I get hit with another 15% increase. And if I get hit with another 15% increase, then that's a real problem. We managed to absorb it last time. This time it might be more difficult. Or they could sell up, right? And then we have to enter into the horrible competitive market, which is trying to rent a new flat in London right now. So it's always having that in the back of your mind, which is, even if you are in a good situation, I currently am, I think, I'm paying too much, but I'm in a good situation. I can't rely on that continuing beyond well, three months into the future. Isn't a lot of this, and this is me being devil's advocate, Michael. I don't want you to get too upset, and I don't want our audience and viewers to get too upset. You're blaming the victims and all of this, which is renters. But somebody who's sceptical of this, who's a landlord, just thinks renters don't have it all that difficult, they would say, well, look, Hackney's quite expensive. Okay, why don't you just move somewhere else? Or actually at a more profound level, okay, London's an expensive city. Why do you have to live there? Why don't you just move out? You've got um, Stevenage up the road or whatever, places that are 40, 50 minute trains into London, South End's an hour. Why not move there? What would you say to them? Well, I mean, the first thing is lots of people are doing that, right? So I think 90,000 people left London last year. I mean, obviously some people arrived as well. It's not a loss of population, but 90,000 renters mm -hmm. left the city essentially because rents were too high. Um, that's going to be people leaving their friendship groups. That's going to be people um, having a longer commute to their job. That's going to be people giving up on a job search in, in London where the, you know, the earnings and the career possibilities are probably higher. So that is happening and it's a tragedy that it's happening, really. I mean, the other thing to say is that it's it's not just London. Manchester also had rents increased by 20% last year. So it's it's not just saying move out of London. It's saying move out of any big city. Mm. Move to the suburbs. You as a person in your, you know, the where you should really be feeling sort of most enthusiastic and ambitious about your career development and your social opportunities, you should probably go live in the suburbs because you can't afford to live in a city. Like it, it, it I think it's self-evidently sort of morally problematic. Also, it doesn't make much sense economically, right? So agglomeration effects, to sort of use the very wonky technical term, there are lots of positive externalities to having people live close together because it increases productivity. You have people who are able to, to cooperate with one another, start businesses if that's your vibe, start media companies if that's your vibe. And that can't happen if people aren't able to live in cities and close to each other unless they've inherited a bunch of wealth from their parents, which is the current situation. I mean, you've just said it's rent rises in major cities, but it's not just major cities. I mean, this is the data from Right Move last year. Incredible. Weymouth in Dorset rents up on average 19%. Weymouth. You know, it's, this is not the bright lights of the big smoke. Torquay in Devon, 18%. Torquay. Margate, okay, more understandable because it's close to London, 16.9%. Liverpool, 19.4%. Incredible. Wales rents are up 15%. I mean, it will, Wales. It will be from a lower base, though, right? So, I mean, of this is, this is from not to say there aren't people having real problems but, in Turkey, but, but it, it's still. But people aren't getting wage, and people in Turkey aren't getting their wage increase exactly, by, exactly. Yeah. you know, what was it? Um, 
in Torquay, 17%, 18%. So every, everyone everywhere is struggling with renting at the moment. Everyone but, but the everywhere. argument still works of saying, like, if you want to save some money, move out of London. Like, it's not a, it's not a crazy thing to say. But th- what's interesting is that everywhere last year, and we'll talk about the particulars of last year, everywhere last year saw rents increase everywhere, including the Northeast, where they rose the least, far higher than wages, mm-hmm. far higher. So, for instance, I think if you look at it on a regional basis, rents in Wales up 15%, the southwest 13.7%. Um, where they increased the least wasn't the northeast, sorry, it was the East Midlands, 10.3%. 10.3%. And that's, if your rents are going up just 10% in a year, you've done really well. You've gotten away with it. And yet, again, like I say, kind of kind of absent from the national political conversation. We say if the nurses want 10%, if they want a 10% increase, we say we can't possibly give the nurses a 10% pay increase because that would fuel inflation, Right. The landlords have had a 15% pay increase, a 20% pay increase, right? And I mean, that does way more to fuel inflation than paying nurses a little bit more because the whole point of this wage price spiral is, you know, you have to pay people more for their consumption, then the consumption goes up in price, then you have to pay them more, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the relationship of rent to your wage demands is very, very direct. The relationship of how much rents are rising to how much people are going to demand their of, of their bosses when they say, I, I want a pay rise because I need to cover my costs. Like, it, it's obvious that that has a lot more to do with landlords than it does to do with nurses, yet we accept landlords increasing rents by 15% and we don't accept nurses having a 10% pay rise. Very well put. Talking about the um, the sort of leaving London thing as well, because I think we've got quite different stories on this. I mean, I lived in London 15 years from... 18 to basically like basically your age we're a bit older 34 so 16 years i was in london and um and then i left i moved out um i I rented in portsmouth with my wife because she's from there originally we bought somewhere we'll talk about that we'll park that because that has its own sort of specific points as well um and i think there's there's sort of two sides to this that interests me so first of all i don't think people should leave london i think that's ridiculous but i do also think there's something politically interesting and useful in graduates, members of the professional middle class with socialist inclinations, exploring that possibility mm-hmm. of, of going somewhere and think, you know, the Russians had a word for this in the late 19th century, the, the uh, Narodniks, you know, they go out to the country mm. and they would, you know, talk about socialism to the, to the you know, the, the rural classes at that time, of course, the vast majority of the Russian population. And I, I do think there's something politically useful in it, but obviously you should only do that if you want to. You know, and I think talking about the politics of that at the same time as a crisis where people are being forced, essentially forcibly displaced, I think is kind of, it's kind of wrong, obviously. So you never thought about leaving London? Never crossed your mind? No, it's never crossed my mind. And I mean, I've never, I, I'm not even going to leave Hackney now. And and that's, that's the, no, but the reason, I'll explain why, I'll explain it's why. A big, it's a big horror. If, if. And it's because I'm gay, essentially, right? That, there's a there's a nice gay community built around a network of sort of like a few pubs and a few bars and et cetera, et cetera. There's a, there's a glomeration effect of, of being gay. It's the Silicon, of Valley, of, gay it's the Silicon Valley of gays. Yeah, exactly. Network effects, let's say. Um, so I think if I, if I wasn't gay, I'd probably have moved to Tottenham by now. But I pay a little bit more in rent because I like to be around my people, you know? Obviously, there are gay people everywhere. I'm not trying to invisibilise gay people in Tottenham, but there's a, there's a particular sort of vibrant gay community in Hackney, which is which is why, and I know that's from lots of my friends as well, that's, that's why people are sort of holding out there, even though it's as expensive as it is. That's a really interesting argument. I've never heard that before. Mm. Well, it's actually, I mean- Because often you get the whole gentrifying of the pink pound. What you're saying is actually, I'm, I'm kind of more exploited in the rental market because well, I, want, I want to stay here because of a community really, which obviously we talk, we talk about communities, but not necessarily around LGBT communities. We talk often about sort of ethnic, sort of ident- identity communities. It's both. I mean, did 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 the sort of cultural vibrancy that gay people brought to Hackney probably have an overall effect on increasing rents? Yes. If you were an existing resident of Hackney, I mean, I'm. I don't think of myself as a traditional gentrifier. I'm from the borough next door, but there are going to be people who might well resent sort of like the fact that gay culture has made Hackney a more desirable place to be, and therefore rents have increased. I mean, I, I suppose why I don't obsess over that argument is because I don't think it needs to be a zero-sum game because the issue is policy, right? We could have policies whereby everyone can afford to live in Hackney who wants to live in Hackney. Obviously, not everyone in the country, but everyone who wants to live in Hackney can do. 
we don't have that at the moment because we we don't have any planning when it comes to housing. We don't have social housing building programs, and we have. Well, I mean, we can talk about all of this in a, a, a later on. But we have a system whereby there is a zero sum game, and I do. I don't think it's unreasonable to feel a little bit resentful towards people who have culturally gentrified an area. At the same time, I think it's a bit of a depressing politics to say any kind of cultural vibrancy is a bad thing. Increase it increases rents. So I don't think that's a it seems like a very limited framework to confine yourself to. What is gentrification? It's a word that's thrown around a lot. You just said the word cultural gentrification. What does that mean? So, I mean, gentrification, I suppose, it, it, it means an area which is usually in the centre of a city or towards the centre of a city whereby there was a period where it was an area where lots of poor people lived and then changing tastes and changing sort of economic structures and economic trends meant that middle class people wanted to live there all of a sudden. And then obviously the middle class people have more power than the working class people because they have more money. Um, obviously things can militate against this. If you have an abundance of housing, that's going to militate against the, the, the competition. If you have vast stocks of social housing, that's going to limit the competition. But essentially it's richer people moving to a poorer place and then having more power than the existing residents. And this is, this is to do with big economic trends, right? So essentially after the Second World War, you have mass car ownership that opens up the suburbs to a whole new load of people. Living in the suburbs seems attractive. Um, you've got people working in factories, which are next to the suburbs. Um, so lots of families move out there. Then you have post-industrialism, you have a service-based economy, you have the agglomeration effects in inner cities of service economies. Lots of people want to move back into the center. And They're that's, cleaner. Yeah, and, that, and that's why we've seen I mean, the population of London has, has gone up a lot. Since 1997, it's gone from 7 million to 9 million. So you can see why that would create pressures, right? And um, the housing, if you know, you'll, you'll probably won't be surprised to learn, hasn't gone up by the same percentage. So, I mean, that to me is what gentrification is. I mean, there are, there are sort of complex arguments that academics made about sort of like, like the rent gap. So it's this idea that sort of developers come in and they see an area which has been sort of depressed and is, you know, people are paying really low rents because it's super depressed and they see this it's sort of this ability to buy it up for cheap, build luxury housing there, and then rapidly increase the rents. I think there's something to that. I think it, it it's almost more simple than that. It's just people want to people want to live in inner cities because of cultural and social and economic changes, and the system we have means that rich people have more power than poorer people. I mean, you talk about this to one of your guests, um, Anna Minton, and she says there are sort of two big theories. One is cultural, one is economic. I mean, I'm sort of more <clears throat> persuaded by the economic one. And I'll tell you why, because I think as a socialist, you have a set of commitments which basically include the idea that working class people can have nice things. Mm. And I think some of the discourses around gentrification basically say that, first of all, working class things are crap, and the things that working class people enjoy are crap and like, very budget. They don't like nice things. And then secondly, if you try and have nice things in, a, in an area which is primarily working class, you're actually screwing them because you're a gentrifier. And for me, gentrification is, and like you say, of course, it's very complex, but for me, it is about people with access to capital investing in land, in property, in order to make a return on investment. That's the driving force of it. So that, that moves closer to what you call the rent gap. It's closer mm. to that. And, and that makes sense to me. Because when you hear, you know, I listen to some of these property podcasts and they'll say, this year, our recommendations are to invest in Derby and Nottingham. Why? Because there are good jobs. Rent's cheap, property's cheap, and actually you can buy somewhere and you'll have certain yields and you'll be able to get certain rates of return and you'll be able to, you know, buy these places up. Now, that's my view of gentrification. Now, go back to the 60s, of course, it's very different. There weren't property podcasts for starters, but there also wasn't, and we'll talk about this later on, there's a lot we're going to talk about later on, Michael, uh, the financialization of, of availability to cash capital. And I think since that change, we have so much cash floating around with buy-to-let mortgage products and so on, which is all very new. I see it very much through the lens of capital trying to, or money trying to get returns, which is capital, capital investment, trying to make money out of somewhere. So I'll give you an example. I saw an Instagram post and it was of Epilici on, uh, on um, in Bethnal Green, you know, the Italian cafe. Okay, yeah. Been there since the early 20th century. They're fry-ups and whatnot, very, traditional Anglo-Italian CAF, right? Real cultural institution. And somebody on the, and it was, you know, it was an influencer going there and saying, oh, this is brilliant. La, la, la. And then somebody on the comments quite rightly says, this is gentrifying, this is gentrification. And of course there's, there's some truth to that, right? 
this is exactly the kind of media production which adds the cultural value to these things, which makes them more sought after and people pay higher rents and yada, yada, yada. But on the other hand, you're talking about a business which has literally been there 118 years. How can they be gentrifiers? They are one of the few remaining businesses from Bethnal Green when it was anything but, you know, middle class, upwardly mobile, full of yuppies, whatever you want to call it. What's, what's, your, what's your take on that, this idea that nice things are gentrification and we shouldn't have them? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, I, dis- I disagree. I mean, I, there, there were some instances where there was sort of like some quite severe cultural insensitivity. I remember that seems to have sort of gone out of the newspapers. I remember sort of in the last, I suppose, maybe because gentrification has, has, has happened already in, in so many places, but sort of in the, in the earlier stages of gentrification when there was sort of, I remember there being a women's advisory centre for, I think it was for Asian women in Hackney, and then it turned into a bar which was called The Advisory. And then you had, <laughs> then you, you, I think there was there were similar ones with sort of job centres which were turned into yeah, the bars in which had, yeah which had sort of bars which the name was a pun on what it was when it used to serve the working class and now serves sort of like uh, middle class people who sort of think it's ironic and funny that this used to be um, something for working class people. So there, there's definitely something to like insensitivity, and I can also exactly see why people are incredibly resentful if that is displacing them. Um, I suppose. I mean, as I say, I think the problem here is that a zero-sum game has been sort of built by uh, a system which pitches different kinds of renters together. If, if you had rent controls, if you had secure tenancies, if you had mass social housing house building as we did in the 1960s, then I think th- these things could, you know, cohabit um, comfortably, and, you know, heaven forbid, enrich each other, you know. So, yeah, I mean... I, I think it is a bit of a dead end. I mean, I suppose with the investment gap and the property investment argument, there is definitely something to it. I do, and I have found this actually making the podcast, I think there's there's almost like a bit of a left-wing dogma in a way to sort of see investment as the root of all problems. And I do think property investment's use, useless. You know, it's, I don't think it's a socially useful thing to do whatsoever. But I, I, there's a chicken and egg issue because the reason it's, you know, the reason these podcast hosts are going to be saying invest in Derby now is because they can see that people want to move to Derby right so so it's it's changes to the cultural and economic system that means people want to move there there's there's no point in buying up flats in Derby if no one's going to live there and people don't move to Derby because someone bought sure. up some flats right so that, I do so- think it is driven by demand by people not just demand by capital owners Sure, but that is that is not social gentrification or cultural gentrification in so much as Derby is an, an attractive place to live because it has a lot of manufacturing jobs, actually, like Bombardier mm. and so on. Um, and so you have lots of jobs, lots of people move there on actually quite high salaries in many cases to work in engineering and whatnot for just often two, three years. They might not necessarily want to buy. So it was like a niche that they're identifying. I think that's really different to, and I know you think this too, but it's important to say, I think that's very different to oh, look, somebody is in a cafe working on an Apple MacBook with one of those tiny beanies doing video production. I can increase the rent by 20%. That's the kind of place Derby now is. You know, I think it's important to make that distinction. Um, This was an extraordinary story that you were relayed by somebody you were interviewing on the podcast. And they were saying to you that people now looking for flats are putting down deposits just to look at somewhere. How does this work? Yes, yeah, so I actually first encountered this reading an FT article, right? And it was an anonymous person. And they sort of, they said, this, this, this person, unnamed, has told me, the journalist, that they're paying £200, whatever, to view flats. And I was like, well, it's, you know, I trust the FT. It's a good newspaper. But I was sort of like, that sounds like someone's exaggerating to the journalist, doesn't it? But then I did some interviews on this, um, spoke to a girl in her 20s, you know, young professional, worked for an MP. And she had been asked to pay £1,000 to view a flat a thousand pounds to view a flat. So I was like, I, was like, I, I don't get this. What, what, does, what, what happens to the thousand pounds, right? So she says, well, you give them the thousand pounds and if you want the flat, you know, it goes towards, you know, the, the, the normal deposit. If you get rejected for the flat by the landlord, you get it back, which is you know, normally most people are getting rejected by the landlords because there's so much competition for, for housing. If, you, if, if the landlord wants to give you the house, but you don't want it, they keep the thousand pounds. And this this um, woman I was speaking to said she didn't give them the grand that time. But the shocking thing was she said if they'd asked me four weeks later, she was so ground down by the process of of looking for a flat in the summer of 2022 in London that she would have given it 
So like four weeks later when they've been waking up every morning, calling around estate agents for half an hour only to say, oh, you know, we have no available properties, et cetera, et cetera, because you've got, you've got loads and loads of people all in their 20s and 30s waking up at 8 a.m. to call all of these various landlords. It's like, it's not that, well, estate agents, sorry. It, 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 again, why do we have a productivity crisis? Because we're making all of these young professionals spend hours and hours and hours calling estate agents. She did pay, um, I think, £400, £500 a, f- a few times to view a property. She said it wasn't the norm, but it was, it, 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 it's happening. Or at a, least it was happening last time. £1,000 to view a property? And, it's not, and this is not regulated in any way. No, so I, I've been struggling to work out what the law is on this. Because um, if that's income, is it? How is it taxed? And what, I mean, what is that transaction? What is it? Well, well, so I assume. Is it a fine? Well, so what you can do. So it's not a fine. I, I, I as I say, I'm struggling to get to the legal base of this, and I've spoken to estate agents who've told me it's probably illegal. Um, but you know, no estate agent admits to doing it themselves, right? Um, so I think what it is, and I was had this thought when I was speaking to my sister because she said she once sort of got a flat and they were so desperate for a flat that they sort of said, okay, we'll do a Zoom view and we're going to pay the deposit because we want this. Um, And then I suppose they had paid the deposit beforehand, but if they then got to the flat and said they didn't want it, then they would, you know, they would lose it. But if, if an estate agent is asking for more than one person to pay this deposit, that to me seems kind of illegal because you can't, you can't demand a deposit from multiple people for the same thing. But, also, but I don't know. I'm not. I'm not a legal expert on this. It's it's just a sign of how out of control this this system currently is. And also, there's 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 just not many counter incentives. So like, there's let's say you have ten people view. And they, they all give a thousand pounds each. You could just say, you know what? Say say all of them can move in. Say yeah. all of them. Obviously, two or three will come back and say <laughs> we found somewhere else. Yeah, yeah right. So they keep the grand. And you'd be like, do yeah. three grand. Easy, easy money. Easy money. Yeah. Yeah, if you're, it's theft. We should say, if anyone's watching this and is one of the people who they paid the deposit and didn't get it back, I would be very interested to hear your story. There's no counter incentive. What's the counter incentive there for these people to be, for the estate agents to be honest and mm. say, you know, incredible, a thousand pounds. And the fact you, I don't know she paid four or 500 pounds. And then you say, and I know you've already mentioned this, but it's important to underscore it. This is someone in their twenties who works for an MP. Mm. This is somebody who works in parliament for one of the 650 most powerful legislators in the country. And she's basically homeless. Yeah. Towards the end of this process, she's having to sort of- Catch stuff. Yeah. And she only finds a house once. And this is important because, you know, most people who have a reasonable housing situation is by luck, right? So so she'd been looking for three months and she, it's important. She never got accepted for a flat by a landlord. <laughs> she, she ended up have, finding somewhere to live because a friend of hers owned a house and was moving abroad. So her and the friend she was looking for apartments with moved in there. So if that stroke of luck hadn't happened, you know, could be looking for, and as you say, this is someone on a reasonable salary, work for an MP. I mean, if you think, why, why do we have, why is, why is policy so terrible in this country? Because all the special advisors are spending their whole mornings looking for flats. I mean, obviously it's also because we have corrupt politicians, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, I, I think there probably is something to that. But it goes back to the question I asked you earlier about why isn't this a political salient issue? politically salient issue, because I'm sure there are many, many conservative policy advisors or media people or, you know, spads or maybe spads are paid a bit more, aren't they? But there'll be lots of younger conservative parties sort of apparatchiks and bureaucrats experiencing this exact same set of problems. Yes, many of them are rich. Yes, many of them will get the, the bank of mum and dad to help them. Some won't, right? Some will have, have to make their own way or some will have to endure it at least just for several years. They know how dysfunctional the whole thing is. They know. Well, there, I mean, there is a divide in the right now. Um, you know, Tom Harwood is an interesting sort of vector of this on Twitter. He's he's you know complaining about rents and uh, and the like a lot. I mean, the right's answer is yimbyism, and this is sort of a a movement within the conservative coalition, mainly of young people, potentially young people who don't have incredibly rich parents, so won't in, inherit a lot. I mean, probably a lot of them do actually. When I think about this sort of biographically but in, in theory these are people not enough for london anyway yeah, right? th- th- these are people who sort of 20 or 30 years ago the jobs they have would have been able to very easily get on the property ladder and, and buy somewhere nice they're now very pissed off that they can't and there is basically a division within the conservative coalition of the yimbies which means yes in my backyard so it's the opposite of a nimby not in my backyard and what they want to do is liberalize the planning system so that more houses can get built and essentially i mean i think 
there is some wisdom to it. I, I, I want more houses to get built. I think we disagree on, on how to do it. But the cynic in me thinks that what they want is the minimum amount of sort of policy intervention to allow them to get on the housing ladder, to get back to 70%. And then, you know, essentially they'll likely pull away the ladder for everyone who can't get on that bottom rung of the housing ladder. So that, I suppose uh, to summarize, there is a group of people within the Conservative coalition who are very, very close to being homeowners, but not quite. And what they want is to escape the private rental market by just a few more houses being built. So potentially they can get onto the property ladder. So you said yimbyism, nimbyism, not in my backyard is the, is the, is the uh, acronym that most people will be um, aware of. They probably haven't heard of yimbyism. It's a bit more, you know, a bit more, you know, au courant, very 2022. Like you say, people like Tom Harwood talking about it in the, in the media and whatnot. Yes, in my backyard. I mean, I find this really interesting um, because we've spoken about this before on a Tisky Sow, which is now Navarra Live, about nimbyism. I, I mean, I see myself as both a yimby and a nimby. So, for instance, you know, we walk past, sometimes there's, there's a new store or a shop or a bar where we live, and um, my wife's a counsellor. Um, and she'll say, oh, yeah, no, there'll be people will, you know, make... Um, uh, demonstrations that not to be built, you know, t- towards officers or councillors or whatever. Oh, that will have some issues or whatever, you know, just conversation. And I think, what do people want? Do they, do they want their entire high street just to be like empty shop fronts? Like people need jobs. We need businesses. We need tax. We need business rates. If somebody wants to start a business and fill it up and get something going there, what's the problem? But like there seems this extraordinary energy now to do nothing. Don't build anything. Don't make anything. Don't start anything. Just, I want my little peace and quiet and my little home. And it seems like the default for so many homeowners. So on that on that front, you know, I am a yimby. But then on the other side of the coin, um, and it's something we'll talk about in a moment with HMOs, houses and multiple occupancy, what breaks my heart is seeing three-bedroom houses, which should be family homes, um, and they're becoming four or five-bedroom apartment blocks. So people are basically going into these houses and they're adding an extra bedroom with a stud wall. Sometimes they even move the floors. You know, you'll look at a window. I don't know if people have seen this probably. And you actually see a floor running across the window because they've added another floor into the building, often because they're actually going down to the basement, which isn't a whole floor in itself. Maybe it's 1.5 metres. And I think that's outrageous. You know, I think we absolutely need to build new, new stock. Of course we do. But we seem to be in this really strange moment where the only new stock or the only new supply which is being built is this very haphazard, very atomizing way, actually, of like people living in basically in these one room bed sits by themselves. Where do you sit on that, Michael? Because I think we've been agreeing on too much. What, Let's disagree on something. I think that actually both of those are kind of yimby positions because I, I mean, maybe this is where we disagree, because I think ultimately the reason we have these HMOs, which are, you know, that, that's not a new development normally, right? You're, you're talking about a, a residential, what would have been a family home, which has been converted to a HMO. But they have to get, housing or multiple they, they should get an, an HMO no, license. They'll get, they'll get a license, but we're not talking about new, you know, yimbyism isn't so much about what license a building gets. It's, well, no, it's about bricks and mortar and, and building new They might spend, right? remember, they might spend 70, 80 grand on it, right? Yeah, but you're not, yeah, but you're, you're not really creating new housing. I suppose you are housing more people than you would be if it was a family home. Yeah. But the, the, the Yimby argument is essentially we need to build with bricks and mortar more houses. Now, at the moment, the Yimby movement is very much dominated by right wing as it's a movement within the Conservative Party who want to achieve this by liberalising planning laws and basically giving more powers to developers. Um, it doesn't quite yet exist, but I think there probably will be quite a powerful left Yimby movement ultimately emerging, which is to say we need to build new houses. Some of them can be private. Some of them should be social. We need to you know, radically change how we tax land, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can get them constructed. Now there is, and I found this a bit perplexing in a way, there is a big group on the left who are really committed to saying supply doesn't matter. Saying the supply of housing is a complete uh, red herring. This is a developer's argument. And I don't buy it at all, actually. Who says that? Um, lots. Of, so there's someone at the Tony Blair Inst- Institute who's done some, you know, sensible writing about sort of the financial system. But he thinks that, and some people I've interviewed, I don't want to like name names because they're all people I really like, but say like the- He wants, Sher- by the way, Sherry Landlord, uh, Sherry Blair's a massive landlord. Some of it's like, mm. you know, like, don't but talk no, there, about but there are lots of left wing, the There are lots of left-wing organizations like Positive Money wrote a report, which I thought sort of fell into this hole. Um, this guy at the Tony Blair Institute has, has done it as well. Um, people who are 
reasonable economists and and left wing. And you also see this from sort of like campaign left wing campaigners against developments. They'll be like, no, the issue isn't that we need new houses. The issue is empty homes. What we need to do is we need to bring the empty homes back into use. And that means we don't have to have these complicated, difficult conversations about whether to build a huge new block of flats in a London borough. Right. And because that, that's the way that you get out of the difficult questions if you're on the left. Right. It, it doesn't work. Now, the one of the things I'd recommend people to do, if you're reading one of these papers, which purports to show that we don't need new housing supply, is look at their methods. And one of the methods that they often use is they say, well, um, housing supply year on year is exceeding household formation. Now, household formation is when you a new group of people form a household. Right. So if if I move out of my house and move in with a lover, that's a household formed. Although, you know, the household I'm currently in will have, will have changed. But, and I've had this conversation with people, you can't form a household without a house. So it doesn't prove anything if supply is outpacing household formation. I find it very bizarre that there's lots of papers which use this argument. The other thing I find very persuasive on this front, so conversations I've had on the podcast actually as well, sort of people saying, well, the reason it's not about supply is because you look at somewhere like Germany or or Austria, they have rent controls, they have social housing, and it's much cheaper than it is here. Well, they also actually have more houses. So in the UK, we have 40 um, houses per 100 people. In Germany, we have 50 per 100 people. In France, we have 60 per 100 people, right? So so if you look at the, the league table is a funny way of putting it, but if you look at a chart which shows you how many houses a country has per people, the UK is right at the bottom. I mean, Ireland actually is a little bit lower down and they actually have a bigger housing crisis than we do. So uh, we do need more housing supply. Yes, it's not the only thing that matters, but we definitely do. I mean, another fact I think, which sort of, I think is quite indisputably shows this, population of London since 1997 increased by 28%. Jobs increased by 45%. Housing increased by 20%. Now, if you just look at those numbers, it's clear that there is going to be some serious competition over the housing that exists because the population has increased faster than the housing stock has. Like it's, it, I think you have to do some quite difficult mental gymnastics to try and argue that supply doesn't matter at all. I mean, particularly with immigration as well, I think this is really important. And it's another issue the left just doesn't want to talk about. If you mention immigration, the reality is, you know, last year we had 1.5 million people enter the country, half a million leave the country. So you've got, you know, a net increase of half a million people. They're welcome here. No problem with that. But clearly that means you need to build new houses. Well, that, and so the idea that oh, supply is not an issue, well, we've got half a million, and that's not through increases through births, by the way. That's just people who are immigrating in the space of one year. So I find this argument on the left perplexing. If so, well, it's, well, it's are, really, are people really saying that? No, it's, it's really interesting because also I've read papers which sort of argue it's dangerous to say supply matters because if you, if you pretend that rental prices and house prices are about supply and demand, you're buying into an argument which people who are against immigration might buy into. You're, so, so who says that? There's this, again, I think that's in this report. I, I, Tony Blair I, Institute. Uh, I don't think the Tony Blair Institute says that because they're less concerned about what people think about migration. It's, it, it's more we're talking about left-wing papers. Um, I don't want to name names also because I'm not exactly sure what's in what paper. Right, so okay. I, I don't want to misattribute. So Michael um, Walker is so fair. Yeah. But, uh, anyone who wants examples of these papers, my DMs are open. You'll have whatever. to subscribe to the Patreon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, people say it's a right-wing argument, pro-developer argument, anti-migrant argument, because if you say it's about supply and demand, then you're agreeing with the BNP. It's sort of like, well, no, I mean, we do need... Obviously, I'm pro-immigration. I think it makes for richer cities. It makes for more vibrant cities. It's good for the economy. Like, it's, it's great. But it, you can't really argue that if you have the same level of housing stock and more people, that's not going to create competition. So for me, the right-wing argument is to say, fine, less people. The left-wing argument is to say, okay, great, more housing. Instead of saying supply doesn't matter. So we talked about the economics of supply and demand. Um, let's talk about something else. You've interviewed people on this podcast series um, who've relayed the most extraordinary stories of what it's like to live in rented accommodation. Now, I've lived in lots of rented accommodation. You, you're a renter. Lots of people who are watching this are renters. We all have bad stories, but some of the stuff you touch upon is absolutely horrific. Can you talk about some of the worst things you've heard happening to renters in the rental sector? Yes, yeah, so I should be clear that probably the worst examples you're thinking of from the podcast were relayed to me by a guy called Al McClenahan, who works at Justice for Tenants, which is a brilliant organization, which represents people who are, you know, having a terrible time with landlords. So by the way, if you are having a terrible time with your landlord, I really recommend speaking to Justice for Tenants. Really 
powerful sort of testimony I got from from him. And some of the examples he was giving of some of the worst situations he's found people in. There was a group living in a house. I think this was a house share. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but during COVID, the landlord thought this would be a good time to extend the property, um, you know, to make more money. And so while they're still living there, he knocks down an external wall in the garden, right? And they have to live for months on end in a building without an external wall to the back. And this is winter. And this, right? is so the ki- this is the kitchen, This is the right? kitchen. This is the kitchen. So in the kitchen for a whole winter during COVID, you don't, you don't even go to work, right? It's really depressing. That you, you have to suffer going through to make your tea with all of the elements there. They also couldn't use their living room because the builders were using it for tools. And also the completely bizarre thing he told me that um, he the landlord brought around a bag of asbestos and said, can you please dispose of this for me? Like I asked him, really impressive guy. I asked him like, you know, is, is that, that sounds like a crime to me. He's like, well, I do civil law, so I'm actually not sure if it's criminal, but it's definitely unlawful uh, for a landlord. So in, in that situation, they did get a rent repayment order. So the landlord- so they were still paying rent when was, this was happening? Yeah, because yeah, they didn't want to get evicted. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't understand. It's obviously awful, but if he said, look, I want you to stay, this this horrible thing has to happen. You can stay, but just don't pay any rent. I mean, that would be, obviously that's terrible because they shouldn't be subjected to those, you know, that, that situation. But I mean, it's in a way it's fair. Yeah, they're, still, they're still paying rent, yeah. You can, you can agree to some sort of quid pro quo, but they're actually paying the same amount of money for a completely different product yeah. because they're exposed now to the, the elements. And the, the more tragic ones are the ones that involve kids as well. I mean, obviously that's tragic, but the ones that are like, oh my God, are the ones that involve kids. There was, there was one, and I suppose why this became so sort of disgustingly outrageous is because what it was is you've got a dodgy landlord who buys a property which someone else was already renting out. He doesn't have a landlord license, so he can't give a section 21. So a section 21 is a no-fault eviction, which if you're a you know legal above board landlord, you can give out willy-nilly, one of the worst things of our rental system. But he couldn't do that. One of the few landlords that couldn't do that. So he was essentially trying to bully out his, his tenants instead, was going around saying, um, so according to Al McClenahan, you know, black people don't deserve nice things threatening them with tools. Um, apparently all the bathroom fittings were falling off, which meant that the floor was incredibly damp. And the story ends with Al representing this family in court and the fire brigade have come to give evidence and they're giving evidence because the floor became so damp that a hole was created in it. And the mother of a you know a young child is found with her legs dangling into the living room and her arms like this in the bathroom, just, you know, praying that the bit of floor that her arms are sort of holding onto don't also collapse because then she would have fallen through right so and and again these are these are the extremes this is illegal what's happening but also i thought what was really powerful that al told me is that essentially he's convinced this is the tip of the iceberg that for every one person he represents and takes to court there are 40 other people who who didn't go to court because also you've got to you you got to understand i think this is this is people who are more marginalized, right? So it's gonna be recent migrants, people who don't have much confidence that either they can navigate the legal system or that if they try to, anyone's gonna to listen to them. And to be honest, that's probably an assumption which is not completely un- unreasonable unless you find a good organization who are willing to you know, really put the effort in. I'm sure there are a lot of government agencies that you'd call up and they'd say, oh, just wipe down the walls or whatever. I mean, I'm thinking of my time as a renter and I think I lived in half a dozen places with black mold. It's just normal. Mm. And it was normal, I mean, I grew up, we. we you know, we had a place when I was a kid when we were, we were well, both my parents rented until they were in their 50s, really. And I mean, the first place we lived in, no central heating, um, which sounds makes me sound really old. I mean, this is the 1980s. Uh, and yeah, you did have to do that thing of just keeping all the windows open and mold. And you know, I had asthma and I thought it was I thought it was normal. Then you buy a place. Mm. And of course, we had black mold where we live. Right. Similar thing. You speak to you speak to a builder. You go, oh, no, that's, you just need to fix the gutter. And that's why the water's coming in and a couple of hundred quid mm-hmm. and it's sorted, right? I know that's not all damp treatment, but the, you know, that's a lot of it. No, homeowners don't have damp, really. No, I mean, I, you, you can look at the statistics of this. You they, can they, sort it out. They don't. The p- people who have damp are private renters above all than social renters. I think we get, we, we hear a lot about sort of the horrific stories that come from social renting. They are horrific. You know, a baby recently, you know, a court found that they died because of mold in a social rented property, right? But that is also happening in the private sector. And I think that the thing to remember, it's not really about social housing versus private housing. It's about poor people versus middle-class people. Mm. If you're a middle-class person, you're not gonna be falling through your bathroom floor, you know, because 
you have representation. It's also different sectors of the market. So I suppose at that that bottom sector of the market, what you're trying to do, because you know your you know potential tenants don't have that much money, just trying to cut costs as much as possible and pack as many people in as you possibly can, and that's where you get sort of like is, a real criminal land. Is that true though? Because I mean, I we rented a place in Hackney. You know, you're your neck of the woods, mm. and I think this is <clears throat> six, seven, seven years ago, um, and we were paying about fifteen hundred pound a month, which you know back then was top dollar, and there was a gas boiler we had, which was leaking and you could smell gas there. Wow. Um, there were lots of things wrong with this flat. Then we said, you know, can we see the safety certificates for the boiler for X, Y, Z? It didn't have any of it. Mm. And you think, well, hold on. My wife, you know, she's former general, um, you know, uh, student, you know, union general secretary at the London School of Economics. Yeah. I was a PhD student. You're meant to be the economically privileged part of society. You think they even treat us like this. And it, like you say, it does make you think the lowest 20 30 percent of the rental market what the hell are they doing mm. when they feel like they can act with impunity so, and they, they, they kind of can as yeah. well like there are rare cases where they get taken to court and they have to do a rent repayment order which is you pay back the rent for a for a year or whatever um but they generally can get away with it because people don't know their rights but also even if you do know your rights i mean i've sort of mentioned this before but you if you complain to your landlord in a seriously assertive way you're probably not going to be able to stay there for very long Right, because they can evict you. I mean, it is the case that if you lodge a complaint, they're not actually allowed to um, serve you a Section 21 notice while that complaint is sort of being processed. You know, if you log it formally and legally, because that would be classed as a revenge eviction. But, you know, once that case is over, you might have got your rent repayment order, but they're not going to keep renting the house to you. And, and for most people, it doesn't get that far. So you just think, if I complain about the damp too much, they're going to kick me out when my yeah. tenancy is over. And the one thing worse than living in a damp, expensive house is not having a house. You said Section 21. Section 21 is no fault eviction. So explain a no, a no fault eviction. I think for most people out there, they would find this who aren't familiar with renting, they'd find this remarkable. Yeah. Well, well in a way, it's interesting you say it's remarkable because it's been around so long in Britain that it's now become the norm. So it was like, so a Section one, a section 21 eviction, sorry, basically means that a landlord can do, it's their property, they can do what they like with it. So they'll give you a tenancy so mine is 12 months we asked for 24 months to have some certainty no they said 12 months and then once that is over they can kick you out with just two months notice and they don't have to provide a reason now that not having to provide a reason is important because if you compare us to a place such as germany for example where you have indefinite tenancies to evict someone they need to either you know they need to have done something wrong essentially they need to have not paid you rent on time mm. that's the key one Right, so so you can evict someone if they haven't paid you the rent on time for three months in a row. Here you can evict someone because you don't want them to live there anymore. And you speak to landlords, they're like, it's my property, I can do whatever I want with it, you know. I, I'm lending you my car, now I want my car back. The difference is that housing is a little bit more fundamental than most consumer goods, which you might think <clears> you can have unqualified property ownership over. And so you, this, this kicks in after how long? The no fault evictions? So uh, if you're outside of a defined period of, of of contract and so most people you'll be you move into a house you're on a 12 month contract and then after that it just becomes a rolling contract and if you're on a rolling contract which means you know month by month they can give you a section this can't, this can't happen in a 12 month contract it can't happen within the 12 month contract but most people aren't within a contract and 12 months is not very long anyway so i was talking earlier about the fact that i'm dreading july because I, that's when my contract ends and i don't know whether they're going to increase my rent or if it does or, you know you don't know, you've got no security. And the Section 21 just means that they can evict you with two months notice. And Shelter and all the charities, they hate the Section 21 because it makes lots of people homeless um, and it gives you no security. It's actually one of the things which is potentially going to be changed in the rental reform bill, which keeps getting postponed and postponed and postponed and postponed. But I think there was a recognition that now that private renting is a tenure which affects more of the population, 20% of the population, they but they have to do something about Section 21 because it is so untenable and unbearable to not be able to plan more than two months in advance. I mean, can you imagine raising children in that, in that context? Yeah. And there will be more families with kids renting. I think in, in the media, the, who dominate the conversation about renters is people like me, right? Because the story is these are people who would have been homeowners. They're upwardly mobile. They're exactly the kind of people that the media class are sort of used to treating as real human beings, right? Because they remind them of themselves. They're like their kids. And so there's this story. These people should be homeowners, but they're not. What a tragedy. And I think what you're ignoring, what you're missing is that, yeah, a lot of these people are also families, you know, who, you know, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily sort of like media ready as all of these 30-something professionals, but they're being screwed over much more severely 
than the 20 and 30 year olds. You're also going to have loads of, who was I talking to about this? I was talking to my housemate about this this morning, actually. Sort of, we are very soon, and I mean, we already will have lots of people in their 40s who are in shared housing. <clears throat> yeah. You know, so you've got shared housing, like, well, like what I live in now, but people in their 40s and 50s. We're, we're going to have people like in student houses from their whole adult lives. And then when you think about it, you've got all these, pe- imagine being a privately renting pensioner. You're a pensioner, like you've, you've worked all your life. You want to live out your twilight years in peace and your landlord can evict you at any point in two, within two months. Like, how is that a way to run a society? I mean, it, it, I don't think we quite have that crisis yet because of the timing of this, but that is a ticking time bomb. Well, so stick with the families and then go to the pensioner point. I mean, you've got kids, let's say you've got two or three kids, they'll be in schools, mm. they'll have friendship circles. Like, it's just remarkable that you can say at the drop of a hat, sorry, you now have to move. Mm. And particularly in somewhere like London or Manchester, mm. it's just unthinkable. And I, one of the reasons why you know my, my wife and I left London was precisely for that reason. We did not want to start a family renting. Mm. We thought it's, it's, for me, I mean, some of the things you talked about a moment ago with um, the conditions that these kids are being subject to, with the worst, you know, the worst possible conditions that you, that were relayed to you by this gentleman you were interviewing, it seems to me it's tantamount to child abuse. Mm. If you're saying, I'm willingly going to subject a child to these conditions and do nothing about it. So I was talking to Vicky Spratt, who's the housing correspondent for the I newspaper, does great work on this. She's written a book called Tenants. And, and she tells the stories of lots of people in these you know, circumstances. One is a family, um, I can't remember how many children, you know, four or five, lots of children basically, and a mum. Um, and the, the landlord basically does a, an eviction just like this. And I think if you're someone who owns a property and you're inflicting that onto children, I think it's child abuse. I really do. The amount of, the amount of, sort of mental anguish that they're being subject to seems unforgivable. And then on top of that, this is remarkable. One of the children died because they no longer had access to their old GP. The child was an asthmatic. Because they moved, they had a new GP. The GP wrote the wrong prescription in terms of what inhaler they needed. The child died. Mm. And you just think, this is because a landlord wanted, what, an extra 10% that year rent? And, and to go back to the point about pensioners, and you're right, we're not there yet. It's absolutely coming. Pensioners who don't own property are screwed two ways. So firstly, over the whole of their working life, they're paying more, so far anyway. I mean, okay, I know love, landlords love to talk about high interest rates this year. Over the last 15 years in particular, they've been very, very low. So they're paying more to rent. And then once they've retired, not only are they still paying rent, unlike a homeowner who, by the way, has paid off their mortgage, but they also don't have equity to draw upon to buy stuff, right? Mm. So. And also, on top of that, our elderly care model in this country is a significant extent, and this is wrong, I think it's bad, it should be through general taxation, but to a significant extent is drawing down the equity in homeowners' houses to pay for their elderly care, right? So this is so dysfunctional. Like, And so as millennials, as we get older, as we enter our 60s you know, and, and mid-60s in what, around 2050, this system you know, cannot function, it cannot function. Marx calls this you know, social reproduction. You have a crisis of social reproduction. And that's exactly what our rental model is inflicting on people. They don't want to have children, or they can't have children, or they can't raise them properly because of things like no full evictions. And then when you're older, you can't basically be looked after properly because of you know, your relationship to the property market. Um, the thing about Section 21, though, I mean, we've talked about lots of really difficult problems on this podcast. Supply is hard. Yimbyism is hard, planning, regulations, et cetera, et cetera. But this seems like a really simple thing you could change, which would make the lives of millions of people much better overnight. I mean, they probably will. I, I think, I mean, I, I, said, I, I probably said that with a little bit too much confidence, but I mean, even the Tories were planning to do that. I think Michael Gove wanted to do that. I mean, I, I say wanted, he's obviously still the housing secretary, but I'm not sure if they're going to have it in them, you know, before the next general election. But I would imagine that when Labour come into power, you probably will get something along the lines of the rental reform bill, which is to get rid of Section 21. Now, of course, if you get rid of Section 21 without some form of rent control, then it's not going to mean very much because you can have a landlord that says, well, you can stay in the house, but your rent's going to go up 50%, right? So so it, it, that, that that's a no-fault eviction by another name. So you would need to have some form of rental control in there. And I imagine that's what, you know, the landlord lobby is going to be 
biting tooth and nail. So it, the devil will be in the detail, but I, I think there is a recognition that it can't continue quite as it is. You mentioned the landlord lobby. Buy to let landlords. Are, are these people involved in something which is fundamentally immoral? I think yes and no. And I, in a way, I've sort of softened my position on landlords as I've been making this podcast. And I'll explain my position there. I, I think that the, the relationship between tenant and landlord is a fundamentally immoral one because you've got a poorer person who is spending a large proportion of their income to buy a richer person an asset. And just to clarify what I mean by that, you, you, know, you are essentially paying your landlord's mortgage. So the landlord will say, I'm not making much profit. You know, it only barely covers my mortgage. Fine, it only barely covers your mortgage. But at the end of it, you get an asset worth half a million pounds. At the end of it, I've paid you know, depending on how long you've been there, 80 grand towards your asset that you get. That's fundamentally immoral. It's feudal. Right? It's a feudal relationship. Why I have potentially softened on landlords, though, and I think this was probably, this doesn't change that it's fundamentally an immoral relationship. It, it was probably doing the episode on the rental crisis in London and, you know, the particular one. So obviously there's been a, a very long-term rental crisis in London for a number of years, but there was a very acute one, um, last summer, it's continuing till now, I think potentially abating slightly it was at its most extreme last summer. And I mean, we've talked about how difficult that meant it was to rent a house. It also meant that average rents went up by 20% or so. A big reason there was that lots of landlords decided to sell up during the pandemic. They did so partly because house prices went up so they could cash in. You know, if, if you own this asset and suddenly the asset's gone up by 20%, you're thinking, oh, that's quite a good option, actually, I'll sell up. Also, they were concerned um, that you know, they weren't so confident that their rental income stream would continue during the pandemic. So there's all this perfect storm, which meant that a lot of landlords sold up. There are also changes to the tax system, which haven't which haven't actually benefited renters, even though they did punish landlords. And that didn't work very well for renters, right? There, there potentially would have been a few people who got on the housing ladder who wouldn't otherwise have been able to, but you created a lot more renters without a home. And the proof is in the pudding, right? Rents went up. It was more difficult to find a house. So... I don't think landlords selling up is on its own the solution to the housing crisis. I also don't think they're as politically powerful as I once thought. And the reason I say this is because what landlords are really angry about whenever you speak to them at the moment is it's not a potential labor policy. It's what George Osborne did in 2015, 2016. It's quite, it's, this was new to me, right? So George Osborne in 2015, 2016 changed the tax regime around landlords and rent so before you paid income tax on your profit and your profit being you know your, your rental income minus your mortgage payments, you paid um, tax on that, right? He changed it so that you didn't get to take off the mortgage payments. Now, I, I'm t perfectly fine with that. <laughs> I don't think there's any moral problem with that, just as I said, because I don't think you can talk about it in terms of profits and losses because you end up with this huge asset at the end, right? I, I don't feel bad for landlords because of this, but, but what that did do is meant that less buy to let landlords bought properties. There were fewer private rental properties on the market and that did make it harder to rent and it did make it more expensive to rent. I'm actually sympathetic to that though and that might surprise some people, but these people, yes, are having an asset paid for by the tenant, very bad, but at least when they sell it, they're paying capital gains or, you know, there's a, and that, that should be far higher, right? Capital gains should be higher if not, you know, the same as income tax, it's presently significantly lower. So I, I understand that point because they'd say, well, look, you'll tax me on the income. And then when I sell it, you're going to tax me on the capital gains anyway. So that does seem unfair. Yeah, because the argument they're saying, you're, you're taxing me on the revenue, not the profit. And normal yeah. business gets taxed on the profit, they get taxed on the revenue. Exactly. Now, I, I mean, I, I, I don't yet feel sympathy for them. I suppose what I'd say is I'm happy to have a policy program that makes it very unattractive to be a landlord, so long as we're providing an alternative for private renters. And I think the fact that that policy program didn't work for private renters actually tells you something about why it was introduced by George Osborne. What that policy was about was those, you know, that tiny sliver of people who were just close to getting on the housing ladder, you know, who would have just got on that housing ladder if only uh, a few less buy to let landlords bought, bought a house instead. So it would have benefited a very small sliver of society. But and actually, you think that's why it was done? I think that was probably why it was done, yeah. Because the, the Tories are worried about reproducing, we talk about social reproduction, or political reproduction of the conservative basis homeowners. So they, they need 
I mean, it, it's not Labour, it's the Tories who need 70% of the population to be homeowners, right? So I think that's why he did that. And so this is something I've sort of changed my opinion on throughout the podcast, even though I think landlordism is a completely immoral way of running a society. I I don't think that necessarily bashing landlords through policy, unless you have also um, increased housing supply in some other way, is necessarily going to work in the favour of, of, of private renters. And Avora Media made this fuck landlords baseball cap, sells very well. Maybe we should send one to former Chancellor George Osborne. Yeah, I mean, Char- he fucked landlords. Yeah, he did fuck. Well, I suppose he fucked landlords with that particular tax change. On the whole, that's a big it, tax change. It's though. a big tax change, but on the whole, I mean, he created a society where assets were inflating and wages were stagnating. So, if you own property, as all landlords do, you know, I'm not going to shed any any tears for you. I mean, in terms of the fuck landlords hack, because that is interesting. Before you say that, can I just say I'm not? In, that was a joke. I'm not. I'm not. I don't want to be saying, "Oh my God, Aaron Bastani is now calling George Osborne a socialist or woke." Awful. One of the worst chances this country's ever had. Please continue, Michael. Yeah, in terms of the fuck landlord's hat, I suppose there is, I suppose one thing I, I do still very much stand by, and, and this relates to it being an immoral relationship whereby you have poorer people buying the assets of richer people, is I think there's something which I've called like landlord brain. And this is most apparent with uh, something called soft lords. So soft lord is like someone who you kind of know you know, someone who doesn't think of themselves as a profit maximizer, but they're sort of, they're renting you the house and they're sort of like, well, you know, I, I need to cover the mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. If the mortgage rates got, well, I need to pass that on to you. That's how this relationship works. And they still think they're doing something ethical, but you're not, right? It, 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 you should be absorbing the cost of change. And also I think it's repugnant for a landlord to raise rents essentially. And, you know, unless your costs have gone up dramatically, there is no justification whatsoever to raise your rents. And I think any landlord who, during this cost of living crisis, has increased rent by fifteen percent, obviously you've got you say, "Oh, that's that's the law of the market." You know, I made this investment, I took the risk, and now I'm reaping the reward. No, if you are pushing the cost of the cost of living crisis onto people poorer than yourself, so that you can make extra money for having done nothing extra, that is fundamentally immoral. So, I suppose that's it, it's it's a complex set of positions to navigate because I don't think landlords are necessarily the root of the problem because I don't think they have as much political power as I once thought and we need to increase supply in other ways if we just bash landlords it's not going to work in our favour at the same time I do think it's an immoral practice and if you're a landlord that increases rent whenever you can I think that's deeply immoral Let's talk about a different kind of cap rent caps that's a great segue. <laughs> because this is this has got nothing to do with new supply, and it's often bashed by the right. They say rent caps have never worked anywhere. Is that true? No, no. I mean, there is there is some truth to the argument that sort of mainstream economics makes, which is that there are going to be unintended consequences of rent caps. So if you introduce a if you introduce a rent cap which is like purposefully below the market level you probably are going to get landlords selling up. That becomes a, a owner-occupier home. And I should also say, actually, because there's going to be lots of people saying, well, when a landlord sells up, someone else buys that house. And therefore, that's people being taken out of the rental market. So demand falls just as supply falls. Now, the reason that doesn't quite work is because owner-occupiers tend to live fewer people in a bigger house, right? Because they're rich. They're just <laughs> richer than renters. So I think of it in terms of my flat. My flat's a small council house where three of us are living there. If anyone bought it, it would not be free adults, right? It would be probably a couple, right? I think would comfortably be able to live there. So you'd have three people pushed onto the demand side of the rental market and three bedrooms taken out of the supply side. So just to just to clarify that, I suppose, first of all, that's why I say landlords selling up, unless you have different policy measures in place, doesn't work in the favour of renters. Now, rent caps on their own will have that effect. So if you have rent caps on their own, you'll have landlords selling up and you'll probably get a short-term shortage of, of housing. And you do see this sometimes when people introduce them. Rent caps can be a very useful part of a broader package, though. Like Vienna has rent caps. Vienna is the best place to live in the world. Um, the Economist accept this. Vienna, 60% of people live in social housing. The people who live in private housing have rent controls. And rent controls haven't created a housing shortage because there is an active government policy to constantly increase supply in line with demand. So if you do that, it's great. I mean. Germany has, I mean, lots of people say the reason rents were cheap in Germany, in Berlin, they're actually sort of rocketing at the moment, was because of rent controls. I think that probably had as much to do with supply as it did rent controls, which is a whole other area. It's not because they had looser planning permission, by the way, it's because of the structure of, of their house builders being less insane than ours. 
I suppose to, to cut a long story short, rent controls have a useful place. I would like them. But if you do them on their own, they will have the unintended consequences, which the, the neoclassical econo economists talk about. So their argument is essentially rent controls, other things being equal, will create a shortage, so don't do them. My argument is rent controls, if you do them without changing anything else, will create a shortage. So let's do the other things. That means that a shortage doesn't occur. So it's a policy that Margaret Thatcher is really famous for. She was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom across the 1980s, from 1979 into the early 1990s. She's famous for the policy of right to buy. What was that and was it a mistake? So right to buy was very popular at the time and it was popular even among sort of traditional Labour voters. So it's interesting, I talked to John Bowden who wrote a really great book about council housing and sort of part of his description of the policy to me involved him sort of canvassing to voters on estates who really liked it, right? Because if you were wealthy enough to be able to buy your council house, you had a massive windfall, they were sold at a discount. And, you know, I suppose the argument is why should a working class person who lives in social housing not have the opportunity to become a homeowner like so many middle class people in Britain? Not wholly unreasonable. So the most obvious problem with right to buy is that councils were banned from reinvesting the revenue from selling those houses into new council homes. Now, if there'd been a one-for-one -one policy, right to buy potentially could have been acceptable. There wasn't a one-to-one -one property, one-to-one -one policy, sorry. So what you had was the council housing stock gets bought up and it doesn't get replaced. What do you then have? A housing shortage. And you end up with a situation like I have where I live in an ex-council flat. The landlord hasn't done anything to improve it, yet I pay him three times the rent that I would have been paying to the council, and it just goes to a bank account in the home counties. That's not sensible. Also, because you haven't built more social housing, you're going to have a lot of people who the state has some responsibility to pay for or provide housing for, let's say. That's where housing benefit comes in. So it used to be the case that we spent 80% of the housing budget on the production of homes. You know, something everyone agrees is a good thing. We now spend 80% of the housing budget on housing benefit which is a landlord subsidy. So housing benefit now, this financial year is expected to cost the state 30 billion pounds. That's 30 billion pounds, which is going purely on paying rent. Now, some of that is to social landlords. I think about half of that is to social landlords. So it will go, it'll be reinvested back into the social housing stock or local services or whatever. Half of that is going to private landlords who like my landlord bought up an ex council flat, did nothing to improve it. And now charges three times the rent the council would have done. But it's still, you know, well, I'm not on housing benefit, but lots of people will be. And then it's still the state paying their income. So instead of the state building a house and then getting a revenue stream, a very secure revenue stream from people renting it, the state is sold off houses it built itself. Talk about being cucked. You know, you build the house, you sell it to a landlord, and then you pay the landlord three times what you are renting out for directly to them. Like it's, that, that's not a good deal. No, we're talking in Trumpian yeah. terms. That's a bad, bad Maggie, deal. Maggie cucked yeah. the UK housing market. <laughs> the problem was... Um, at the most obvious level, this would have potentially been a tolerable policy if you had sold off council ho homes and councils used the revenue to build a new council home. So if you had this sort of one-to-one -one ratio whereby you sell a council home, you build a council home, that potentially would have been fine. Um, the opposite happened, whereby Thatcher said, you've got to sell these council homes at a discount and then you're banned from reinvesting that money in, in council housing. So this was a policy designed, like expressly designed to deplete the, the stock of council homes in, in this country. Even, I, I think there's a deeper argument potentially to make, which is that even if you had replaced the homes, it could still have been a bad policy. And the reason I say this is because Nye Bevan had a sort of vision of council housing, whereby it would be a tapestry, a social tapestry of a mixed community. So you'd have beautiful housing with leisure facilities, um, it would be, he was housing and health secretary, by the way. So he had this philosophy where housing and health were intricately in, in, entwined. And so you'd have estates where you've got the, the butcher, the baker, the lawyer, everyone living in the same place, a real sort of engine of social integration, people living in the same tenure. And that's what he wanted to, to introduce. Now, right to buy, that actually was degraded by the conservatives who built as many council homes as as labor in the in the 50s we're talking now so Macmillan but it was to a lower quality so it became a little bit more residualized which residualized means that it became something less desirable something for poorer people as opposed to everyone now so that dream had already died a little bit by the 1980s but right to buy did it completely because obviously what you got is wealthier council tenants bought their apartments some of them moved out and then it was the case that you know 
you are taking the wealthier part of that community out of that community and thereby you are making council housing more residual than it was beforehand and again i've mentioned vienna before but this is where vienna really stands out because they do have the tapestry of a of a mixed community whereby you've got people of all different classes living in social housing and there's less of a desire to have something like right to buy because everyone recognizes oh actually we we like this system so yeah right to buy would have been barely acceptable if they'd replaced the houses but i think even if they had it's it, it's not a desirable policy i mean if you look at it as it was not as it could have been the numbers 1.9 million units sold 345,000 built you've mentioned the thing about 80% of funds previously going to building houses now 80% goes to housing benefit rather than the state getting income it's actually got the outcome extraordinarily stupid policy but then if you look at okay well how is that affecting people today home ownership has fallen by i think about 10 percent or more since the early 2000s home ownership is falling right to buy hasn't helped more people in the long term get on the property ladder rents going up we have obviously fewer social housing units so if you want to be a private owner occupier it's harder than ever and if you want to get social housing it's harder than ever so yes it was very popular with part of the electorate 15 years say but actually in terms of the long-term consequences and that's how we should judge i think public policy it's only going to make things worse from here on in and i actually think if you if you judge it in the long term let's say over 30 40 50 60 70 years i think it may be the single biggest policy failure in this country domestically speaking i'm not talking about foreign policy with swears or the you know the 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 invasion of iraq but in terms of a policy failure i mean what comes close to that where something was making you money now you're spending 30 billion a year on it and it's harder for people to get on the housing ladder and it's harder for, pe for people to access social housing yeah i mean I, I, who, who, and who are the winners there's a tiny number of people the winners are the well the, the few people who, who bought their yeah. not the few people because as you said 1.9 million people bought their council home so they would have got a windfall and but the biggest winner is the conservative party right so this was in a way it was the most disastrous policy of the you know the late 20th century in another way it was the the most genius policy of the late 20th century because what Thatcher fought is I need to cement conservative dominance in society, you know, Thatcherism, which you can say New Labour continued. And she did that by creating uh, a much broader class of homeowners than you originally had. So as you say, homeownership sort of started declining from 2003. So this system hasn't really worked in the long term. But homeownership did increase, you know, during Thatcher's period. And she thought, you know, you convert someone from a social renter to a homeowner, they're more likely to vote conservative. She was right. You know, I think you had, I think it was George Osborne who was saying in the 2010s, it was a Lib Dem, I think, in cabinet who who said that he was saying, oh, we don't want to build social housing. They just vote Labour anyway. So it was a, it was a, a genius piece of social engineering for the, on the part of the Conservative Party, which I don't think Labour, you know, have ever really dealt with or come up with their own version of. So to conclude, Michael, the housing crisis has many aspects. The poorest people live in awful uh, conditions in the private rented sector. Housing benefit doesn't work. We're not building enough homes. Harder than ever to get on the property ladder. What are the solutions to all of this? Yeah, so I think there, I, I don't think there is one magic bullet. I think they're sort of manifold. I mean, I suppose on the, on the most basic level, you can look at someone or somewhere like Germany for sort of in terms of house buildings. Good IPPR report sort of showing that they, they give out a similar amount of planning permission. Um, but the Germans are much better at making those into bricks and mortar building. That's partly because they have a bigger range of house builders. We have a very small sort of monopoly group of house builders who trickle out housing because they are price makers as well as price takers so they don't want to flood the market with new housing because then that will damage their own profit um sort of their bottom line so you want lots of different house builders small house builders large house builders lots of social house builders lots of cooperative house builders you want real diversity um in in the market and i think there are some things where if we're going to have a private rental sector which i mean presumably we are for a while you need to make private renting tolerable. I think the bare minimum to make private renting tolerable is to give tenants some stability, you know, some security, which means getting rid of no fault evictions and having some form of rent control, which which means that you're you're not terrified every summer that your rent is going to get increased by by fifteen percent. There'll be some limits to it. Some again, security and certainty. Um, and I mean, there are some more sort of out there policies. Land value taxes would do a lot of good work. So a land value tax one of the consequences of that would be that people would be less inclined to sort of sit on land 
you know, you, you get taxed every year. So you've got this real incentive to develop as much property on it as possible because you're taxed on the value of the land. You want to make as much use of that land as possible. This is Henry George's theory. Um, I think that would be great. Um, property taxes is slightly easier to implement, probably. That means that people are less likely to sit on more property than they need. At the moment, it's too cheap to be sitting on an asset. You know, it's actually profitable to be sitting on an asset. What you want to make it so is that sitting on an asset actually comes with costs and that will encourage the productive use of those assets instead of people just sitting on them for speculative purposes. So yeah, I think house building, some regulation of the private rental market and then change the tax system. And you've got quite a long way. The Michael Walker manifesto. <laughs> the rule of three as well is quite it's yeah. neat. I'm loving it. Michael, people who've been watching this, uh, where else can they find you? other than the Vara Media. And where can they find this fantastic podcast series? Uh, the podcast series is on all good podcast apps, um, but to get all episodes, it's on the Patreon. So, you know, I've got a team behind this, great producers who are, at the moment are working essentially voluntarily, Lewis Bassett and Patrick Herman. We want to all get paid properly for our work. So we're making half of the episodes behind a paywall, half of the episodes are free. So you can go to patreon.com forward slash crash course pod um, and you can listen to it all. And the first series will be on rent. The second series is going to be on on something else. And you talked about potential series being on the rise of China, climate crisis, big, big topics. Yeah, so my next series, I want to time it with the three year anniversary of the first lockdown. And my sort of, I've been thinking about this for a while, is essentially, I mean, you were talking earlier about sort of COVID on, on Tiski and stuff, how that was a bit formative for, for me and my sort of journalism. I have a really clear memory of the first day of lockdown and, you know, we'd been reporting it on Tiski or whatever. And then, but it was this moment where I was going to Sainsbury's local at like half 10 p.m. because I thought I'll go get some supplies when other people aren't there. I just remember being in, I lived in a big council block at the time, just like the stairwell being completely empty and thinking, this is our World War II, you know, everything changes. Everything changes from this because it felt so unimaginable. And I was also quite, I'm, I'm, I'm generally a, a glass half full guy. So I was also quite optimistic about it. I was like, people are realizing that essential workers matter. People are really appreciating the work that shelf stackers and bin men do. Um, we're really going to listen to scientists now because we ignored them before and we realised that actually it probably does make sense to listen what, to what they say. This is going to be really significant for climate change. You know, we realised that actually states need capacity. I was like, this is going to change everything. Then three years later, it kind of feels like nothing's changed and if anything, it's got worse. So I um, that, that's going to be the... Again, I think I'll probably change my opinion as I make it. I've changed my opinion on housing as I've been making this series. I'm, I'm not going into it with a set answer, but the, the puzzle to begin with is I thought COVID would, would change anything everything sorry and from where i'm sitting now it kind of seems like it's changed nothing for the better michael walker from housing expert to covid aficionado it's been <laughs> wonderful speaking to you it's been wonderful speaking to you thank you so much for having me on downstream thank you for coming on